Hello, this is Michael Schatz, Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology in Practice. It is my pleasure to present to you the highlights of our December 2021 issue. The theme of this issue is Topics in Evaluating Clinical Literature, and we thank editorial board members David Major and Marcus Shaker for serving as coordinators for this theme. The outstanding theme review articles in this issue explore the involving interpretation of screening and diagnostic tests in allergy, review discrete principles of relevance to population level analysis, present a practical guide to understanding cost effectiveness analyses, discuss systematic reviews and meta-analyses, and describe the grade approach to rating quality of evidence and moving from evidence to recommendations. In addition, the coordinators of this theme issue, David Major and Marcus Shaker, have contributed an insightful editorial that does a terrific job of summarizing and contextualizing these theme review articles. In addition to the theme review articles, the December issue also contains two enlightening rostra on the subjects of the choice of biologics in patients with severe chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps and defining optimal medication adherence for persistent asthma and COPD. Now let me present the highlights of the original articles in this issue, which are on the subjects of COVID-19, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, anaphylaxis, asthma, drug allergy, eosinophilic disorders, hereditary angioedema, immunotherapy, and mast cell disorders. The first article is Diagnosing Asthma with and Without Aerosol-Generating Procedures by Drake et al. What is already known about the topic? Asthma diagnostic guidelines recommend using spirometry-based tests to demonstrate variable airflow obstruction. The lack of accessibility to aerosol-generating procedures such as spirometry poses a significant clinical challenge. What does this article add to our knowledge? We describe an alternative approach to asthma diagnosis that does not require in-clinic aerosol-generating procedures. This algorithm includes audible wheeze, blood eosinophilia, and home peak flow variability. The approach may be a useful tool in ruling in asthma and allowing prompt diagnosis and treatment in some patients. How does this study impact current management guidelines? This alternative algorithm could have a role during the coronavirus disease 2019 pandemic and under other circumstances when aerosol-generating procedures are less accessible. This approach had comparable discriminative power to current asthma guidelines and merits external validation. The next article is the clinical implications of aspergillus fumigatus sensitization in difficult-to-treat asthma patients by mystery et al. What is already known about this topic? Aspergillus fumigatus sensitivity has been linked to worse asthma outcomes through associated adverse clinical phenotypes, including allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. However, the clinical relevance and burden of aspergillus fumigatus sensitization within the real-life adult population with difficult asthma is unknown. What does this article add to our knowledge? Stratification of a UK real-life difficult asthma cohort by aspergillus fumigatus sensitization identified a more severe airways disease state with few of the comorbidities commonly observed in difficult asthma. How does this study impact current management guidelines? This study highlights that aspergillus fumigatus sensitization status should be a core early assessment in patients with difficult asthma that could then facilitate management measures to potentially prevent lung function impairment and development of structural airways damage. The next article is Anaphylaxis in Pregnancy, a Systematic Review and Call for Public Health Action by Kara et al. What is already known about this topic? Although rare, Anaphylaxis during pregnancy confers a risk 
to both mothers and newborns. What does this article add to our knowledge? Risk factors for anaphylaxis during each trimester were identified, such as a history of multiple cesarean section deliveries or procedures, personal history of anaphylaxis, and or allergic reactions to medication without allergy workup. How does this study impact current management guidelines? Identification of patients who are at risk and collaboration among different specialists involved in caring for pregnant women should be established to support preventative strategies for gestational anaphylaxis. The next article is Serum Inhaled Corticosteroid Detection for Monitoring Adherence in Severe Asthma by Alamadi et al. What is already known about this topic? Adherence to inhaled corticosteroids in asthma is poor, and yet few reliable methods exist to assess adherence in clinic. What does this article add to our knowledge? Blood detection of budesonide, beclomethazone dipropionate, and fluticasone propionate may represent a new method for monitoring adherence in severe asthma and for fluticasone relate to important markers of disease severity. How does this study impact current management guidelines? Blood detection of inhaled corticosteroids merits further testing as a potential measure of adherence in severe asthma. The next article is Risk of Neuropsychiatric Diseases According to the Use of a Leukotriene Receptor Antagonist in Middle-Aged and Older Adults with Asthma a nationwide population-based study using health claims data in Korea by Shim et al. What is already known about this topic? There has been increasing concern regarding neuropsychiatric adverse reactions as the U.S. Food and Drug Administration stepped up warnings on Montelukast in March 2020. However, there is insufficient evidence for this association, especially in adults. What does this article add to our knowledge? This study did not show any association between the use of a leukotriene receptor antagonist and the occurrence of neuropsychiatric diseases in Korean adult patients aged 40 or older with asthma. How does this study impact current management guidelines? The results could be part of the evidence for alleviating concerns about the occurrence of neuropsychiatric diseases related to leukotriene receptor antagonists in adult patients with asthma. The next article is Intimate Partner Violence and Adult Asthma Morbidity, a population-based study by Wang et al. What is already known about this topic? Exposure to intimate partner violence, IPV, is associated with higher asthma prevalence in adults and their children. What does this article add to our knowledge? This is the first study to show an association of IPV with adult asthma morbidity using a large population-based data set. How does this study impact current management guidelines? Insight into IPV, a prevalent but underaddressed public health issue, elucidates potential etiologies behind difficult to control asthma and will help to improve tailored evaluation and therapies. The next article is the feasibility of a lifestyle physical activity intervention for black women with asthma by Nian Huis et al. What is already known about this topic? Black women experience disparities in both physical inactivity and asthma relative to their white counterparts. Lifestyle interventions tailored to this population are needed. What does this article add to our knowledge? A lifestyle intervention culturally tailored for black women with asthma was feasible to conduct and had high acceptability. Improvements in asthma control and quality of life were also observed. How does this study impact current management guidelines? Addressing physical inactivity and poor asthma outcomes of black women may be delivered through a lifestyle physical activity intervention that is culturally tailored to the unique needs of black women. The next article is Out-of-Pocket Spending for Asthma-Related Care 
among commercially insured patients 2004 to 2016 by Sinaiko et al. What is already known about this topic? Patients report that out-of-pocket costs are a noteworthy burden and barrier to asthma treatment, but comprehensive data on asthma-related out-of-pocket costs are limited. What does this article add to our knowledge? Most of asthma-related out-of-pocket spending was on medications, but patients in lower-income areas had greater spending on high-acuity care and greater cost burden as a percent of income than those in higher income areas. How does this study impact current management guidelines? Understanding asthma-related out-of-pocket spending can impact how clinicians make asthma management plans with patients and inform strategies that reduce cost burden while optimizing medication adherence and timely care. The next article is efficacy of tezepelumab in patients with severe uncontrolled asthma and perennial allergy by Corin et al. What is already known about this topic? Allergic asthma is a common phenotype of severe asthma. Tezepelumab is an antithymic stromal lymphopoietin biologic therapy in development for the treatment of severe asthma. What does this article add to our knowledge? Our analysis of participants in the Phase 2b pathway study shows that tezepelumab reduced exacerbations, improved lung function, and reduced type 2 biomarkers compared to placebo in patients with severe uncontrolled asthma with or without perennial allergy. How does this study impact current management guidelines? Tezepelumab may be a valuable treatment option for patients with severe allergic asthma as well as for those without allergy. The next article is Factors Associated with Asthma Exacerbations During Pregnancy by Bokern et al. What is already known about this topic? Up to 45% of women experience an asthma exacerbation during pregnancy that may be associated with adverse pregnancy outcomes. What does this article add to our knowledge? A history of exacerbations and poor asthma control, despite treatment with moderate to high-dose inhaled corticosteroids or long-acting beta agonists, predict severe asthma exacerbations during pregnancy. How does this study impact current management guidelines? Identifying a history of exacerbation and poor asthma symptom control, as measured by the Asthma Control Questionnaire, despite treatment with inhaled corticosteroids or long-acting beta agonists, identifies those at high risk for exacerbation during pregnancy. Factors associated with asthma exacerbations during pregnancy may help healthcare professionals optimize gestational asthma management. The next article is Asthma Phenotyping in Primary Care. Applying the International Severe Asthma Registry Eosinophil Phenotype Algorithm Across All Asthma Severities by Kirchhoff et al. What is already known about this topic? Asthma remains poorly controlled and characterized in primary care. Many patients are given the diagnosis of asthma and receive regular asthma treatment in accordance with a one-treatment-fits-all, step-up, step-down, guideline-directed approach but with little clinical benefit. What does this article add to our knowledge? Eosinophilic asthma predominates in UK primary care and is associated with a greater likelihood of having asthma attacks, reduced lung function despite a significantly greater steroid burden, and greater healthcare resource use. How does this study impact current management guidelines? The eosinophil phenotype gradient algorithm will enable primary care physicians to identify and categorize asthma patients into those with and without eosinophilic asthma and, when appropriate, refer patients for phenotype-targeted treatment. The next article is Benralizumab Effectiveness in Severe Eosinophilic Asthma with and Without Chronic Rhinosinusitis with Nasal Polyps, a real-world, multi-center study by Nolasco et al. What is already known about this topic? 
Benralizumab was shown to be effective in patients with severe eosinophilic asthma in clinical trials. However, real-world data in patients with the co-presence of chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps are lacking. What does this article add to our knowledge? This study represents the largest real-world evidence so far assessing the effectiveness of venralizumab in patients with severe eosinophilic asthma with or without chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps on clinical, functional, laboratory parameters, and nasal symptoms. How does this study impact current management guidelines? Venralizumab showed rapid effectiveness in the management of severe eosinophilic asthma in everyday clinical practice. Nasal polyposis could be considered a treatable trait because affected patients experienced improvements in nasal symptoms, asthma control, and respiratory function. The next article is integrated safety and efficacy among patients receiving benralizumab for up to five years by Korn et al. What is already known about this topic? The efficacy and safety of benralizumab were demonstrated through phase three pivotal trials lasting 28 to 56 weeks. Previous long-term results with benralizumab are limited to two years of follow-up. What does this article add to our knowledge? Results from this integrated analysis expand on previous studies by demonstrating the long-term safety and efficacy of benralizumab among patients treated for up to five years. How does this study impact current management guidelines? Current guidelines do not consider the long-term impact of eliminating exacerbations in patients. Given the deleterious effect of exacerbations on disease progression, Guidelines should consider zero exacerbations as an indication and a goal for biologics. The next article is Evaluation of Risk Scores to Predict Pediatric Severe Asthma Exacerbations by Neo et al. What is already known about this topic? Predicting which children are at the highest risk of asthma exacerbation is difficult, given heterogeneity in phenotypes and triggers. No single tool is accepted that accurately predicts risk of exacerbation using electronic health record data. What does this article add to our knowledge? Data from electronic health records may be successfully used to predict risk of exacerbation in children of various age groups with asthma. And this approach to risk stratification may be useful in asthma management decisions. How does this study impact current management guidelines? This study provides a practical tool that may be used in the clinical setting to determine risk of exacerbation in children with asthma based on a variety of clinical characteristics and laboratory findings. The next article is Indoor Environmental Factors May Modify the Response to Mouse Allergen Reduction among mouse-sensitized and exposed children with persistent asthma by Sadri Melli et al. What is already known about this topic? Sensitization and exposure to mouse allergen is associated with asthma morbidity among low-income minority children living in urban environments. Reduction of household mouse allergen is associated with improvements in asthma symptoms and exacerbations. What does this article add to our knowledge? Higher baseline mouse allergen and lower particulate matter 10 millimeters or less PM10 levels were associated with a greater response to mouse allergen reduction for many outcomes. Sensitization and exposure to other indoor allergens did not consistently modify the response. How does this study impact current management guidelines? Current U.S. asthma guidelines recommend allergen reduction in individuals with mouse sensitization. These data suggest that mouse allergen reduction is beneficial even with high levels of mouse allergen. Concomitant PM10 reduction may potentiate the benefit. The next article is Development and Validation of a Mobile Clinical Decision Support Tool for the Diagnosis of Drug Allergy in Adults 
the drug allergy app by El Khalifa et al. What is already known about this topic? The burden and impact of penicillin and other antibiotic allergies have been established by many studies. However, the main problem is how to implement a safe clinical decision support tool to delabel patients with inaccurate penicillin allergy. What does this article add to our knowledge? This article describes the development and retrospective validation of a mobile clinical decision support tool for the diagnosis of drug allergy for use by clinicians to delabel individuals with an inaccurate penicillin allergy label. How does this study impact current management guidelines? The drug allergy app may represent a useful clinical decision support tool for non-allergists to diagnose drug allergy correctly and support appropriate antibiotic prescribing as an attempt to address antimicrobial stewardship. The next article is Diagnostic Approach to Hypersensitivity Reactions to Cefazolin in a Large Prospective Cohort by Bogus et al. What is already known about this topic? The diagnosis of cefazolin-induced reactions is complex because of uncertainties concerning the optimal concentration for skin tests. In vitro tests are not commercially available or validated, and provocation tests can be contraindicated owing to the severity of reactions. What does this article add to our knowledge? Skin tests using cefazolin at 20 milligrams per milliliter enabled half of the patients to receive a diagnosis. Basophil activation test sensitivity was 66.7%. It was positive in 75% of patients with negative skin tests. How does this study impact current management guidelines? Skin tests allowed half of patients to receive a diagnosis when using cefazolin at 20 milligrams per milliliter. Basophil activation test is a promising diagnostic tool, especially in patients with severe reaction and negative skin tests. The next article is Safety and Efficacy of Mepolizumab in Hypereosinophilic Syndrome, an open-label extension study by Gleichadol. What is already known about this topic? A phase three study demonstrated that, compared with placebo, four weeks add-on mepolizumab, 300 milligrams subcutaneously, reduced flares in patients with uncontrolled FIP1-like 1 platelet-derived growth factor receptor alpha, FIP1-L1 PDGFRA, negative hypereosinophilic syndrome with a positive benefit risk profile. What does this article add to our knowledge? This open-label extension study found no new safety signals with mepolizumab treatment in patients with FIP1L1 PDGFRA negative hypereosinophilic syndrome. Moreover, mepolizumab continued to control flares and blood eosinophil counts after 52 weeks of continuous treatment. How does this study impact current management guidelines? Findings from this open-label extension study provide further evidence that patients with FIP1L1 PDGFRA negative hypereosinophilic syndrome are likely to benefit from treatment with mepolizumab and may be able to reduce oral corticosteroid use. The next article is Racial and Ethnic Disparities in the Research and Care of Hereditary Angioedema Patients in the United States by Silvestri et al. What is already known about this topic? Pre-marketing clinical trials on hereditary angioedema, HAE, have demonstrated underrepresentation of minority patients, suggesting a risk for real-world disparate diagnosis and management. Anxiety and depressive disorders are more prevalent in HAE patients. What does this article add to our knowledge? Hispanic patients are underdiagnosed with HAE. Black HAE patients may experience disparate prescription practices. Except for higher anxiety prevalence among white HAE patients, mental health disorders were equally distributed across the different HAE racial and ethnic groups. 
How does this study impact current management guidelines? Measures are needed to enhance minority patient involvement in HAE clinical research. Attention should be paid to ensure Hispanic HAE patients are identified and treated. The next article is Efficacy of Subcutaneous and Sublingual Immunotherapy for House Dust Mite Allergy, a Network Meta-Analysis-Based Comparison by Kim et al. What is already known about this topic? Subcutaneous and sublingual allergen immunotherapies are effective therapeutic arms for house dust mite allergy, but comparisons between modalities are limited. What does this article add to our knowledge? To the author's knowledge, this is the first meta-analysis to provide an indirect comparison of the clinical efficacy of immunotherapy modalities with house dust mite extracts. Subcutaneous immunotherapy was shown to be more effective than sublingual immunotherapy in reducing allergic rhinitis symptoms. How does this study impact current management guidelines? This study provides both direct and indirect evidence to assist clinicians in selecting an immunotherapy modality for the treatment of house dust mite allergy. Well-powered, direct, head-to-head -head trials are needed to validate the current results. The last article is Assessment of Osteoporosis and Fracture Risk in Mastocytosis Within a North American Cohort by Makovis et al. What is already known about this topic? Osteoporosis and fracture risk is increased among people with systemic mastocytosis, and existing studies focus on European cohorts. Serum tryptase, bone marrow findings, dual energy x-ray absorptiometry, DEXA scans, and bone turnover markers assess disease severity and bone health. What does this article add to our knowledge? In this North American cohort, we observed lower trabecular bone scores among patients with fractures. We designed a predictive model identifying age, DEXA spine T-scores, and alkaline phosphatase as predictors of fracture incidence. How does this study impact current management guidelines? We designed an interactive calculator based on our predictive model, which allows physicians to use patients' age, DEXA spine scores, and alkaline phosphatase together for improved fracture risk prediction. Thank you for listening to the highlights of the December 2021 issue of the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology in Practice. This is Michael Schatz, and I hope you find this issue beneficial for you and your patients.